Diseases have been history makers and breakers for as long as time has existed, and the dark ages were full of them. Other than the common cold, leprosy, polio plagues, we got a whole lot more that did a heck of a lot of damage, and let's talk about it. A lack of hygiene amongst medieval people led to horrific skin complaints. Poor people washed in cold water without soap, and this didn't really do anything to prevent infection. The more disfiguring skin diseases were generally classified as leprosy. This, caused by the bacterium Mycobacterium leprae, could arise from a lot of dirty conditions. What does it do? Well, it attacks and destroys the extremities of the body, particularly the toes and the fingers, and sometimes the nose. One more body part, and we've got head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Leprosy was not the only disease that could affect someone in this way. The affliction known as St. Anthony's fire could also lead to gangrene and convulsions. This condition was caused by a fungus, good old ergot, that grows on rye. When the grain was ground to make bread, people who ate the bread became poison, and that's how we get witch hunts. One of the most common diseases at the time that doesn't really get talked about enough was malaria. We often think of this as one that originated in Africa, or a tropical disease. But that's because Europeans put in a lot of good effort at the right time to kind of nuke it. Endemic malaria, which claimed 229 million new cases and over 400,000 deaths in 2019, mainly in Africa, was eradicated by Europe by the mid-20th century. Historical descriptions of intermittent tertian and quartan fever reported in texts of Hippocrates in Greece and Celsus in Italy suggest that this was a thing at that time. A few paleomicrobiology investigations have confirmed the presence of the malarial parasite Plasmodium falciparum in 1st, 2nd, and 5th century infected individuals in diverse regions of Italy and Plasmodium later in Bavaria. The causative Plasmodium pathogens discovered in the 19th century in Algeria were controversially used as therapeutic agents in the European pharmacopoeia more than two centuries after effective quinine-based treatments had been introduced in Europe. The discoveries in the late 19th century that malaria is caused by protozoan parasites, which are transmitted by mosquitoes quickly led to intense speculation about its history in antiquity. So the history of this disease has passed through a lot of distinct phases throughout the last couple of hundred years. So it's been present and it's been around. The pox. This one was a common disease. Possibly the most common at the time. We're talking smallpox, chickenpox, cowpox, in order of uh, most severe to less. It is estimated that smallpox was introduced to Europe between the 5th and 7th centuries, with frequent epidemics during the Middle Ages. The first protection against smallpox consisted in rubbing infectious material from patients with smallpox into the scratched skin of the young. Lady Montague brought this method, known as variolation, from Turkey to England in 1721. Albeit dangerous, it was adopted in Europe during the 18th century after the successful treatment of the two daughters of the Princess of Wales. By the end of that century, this treatment had been widely accepted throughout the world as an effective way to prevent smallpox. Edward Jenner was the first to use cowpox in order to protect against smallpox in 1796. Now, This virus caused only mild infections in humans, but induced an immune response that provided cross-protection against against smallpox infection, the principle that underlies the development of all subsequent vaccines based on an attenuated organism. During more than 60 years, the vaccination was carried out from arm to arm with a certain risk of transmission of syphilis. Hence, from 1864 onward, the vaccine was primarily produced on cows to avoid this risk. As the smallpox vaccine was the first vaccine to be widely deployed in humans, it seems quite fitting that smallpox was the first human infectious disease to be eradicated by vaccination, which was a milestone achieved in 1979. Nevertheless, this virus actually remains a risk to this day because routine vaccination is no longer undertaken. The history of the polio infections actually began during prehistory. If you didn't know, polio is an infectious disease caused by the polio virus. Approximately 75% of cases are asymptomatic. Mild symptoms, which include sore throats, fevers, and a couple of cases more severe symptoms develop, such as a headache, neck stiffness, and more. Now, These symptoms usually pass within one or two weeks. And then a less common symptom is permanent paralysis and possible death in extreme cases. Years after recovery, post-polio syndrome may occur, with a slow development of muscle weakness similar to that which the person would have had during the initial infection. Polio occurs naturally only in humans. It is highly infectious, and is spread from person to person either through fecal to oral transmission or via the oral to oral route. Those who are infected may spread the disease for up to six weeks, even if no symptoms are present. Now, This disease might be diagnosed by finding the virus in the feces or detecting antibodies against it in the red fluid stream. The first report of multiple polio cases was published in 1843 and described in an 18 outbreak in Louisiana. A 50-year gap occurs before the next U.S. report, which was a cluster of 26 cases in Boston in 1893. The first recognized U.S. polio epidemic occurred the following year in Vermont with 132 total cases, including several cases in adults. Numerous epidemics of varying magnitude began to appear throughout the country. By 1907, approximately 2,500 cases of polio were reported in New York City. And once infected, there's no specific treatment. Nowadays, the disease can be prevented by the polio vaccine. With 
multiple doses required for lifelong protection. There are two broad types of polio vaccine, an injected vaccine using inactivated polio virus and an oral vaccine containing weakened live virus. Through the use of both types of the vaccine, incidence of wild polio has decreased from an estimated 350,000 cases in 1988 to just 30 confirmed cases in 2022, combined to just three countries. Typhoid is a bacterial infection that still affects hundreds today. We understand this one pretty well. It's a first cousin to Salmonella. Salmonella typhi, the bacterium which causes the illness, and its microbiological relatives cause intestinal and serious systemic illnesses regularly in every country, including the US. Salmonella is a contaminated water and food germ. So when it invades the body from the GI tract into that uh, redness stream, it is one of the more ominous infections and one that's more difficult to treat. It can spread virtually into any organ, causing tissue and organ abscess and necrosis, even infecting arterial vessels, leading to heart valve infection and or aneurysms with the potential to rupture. Further, it is an intracellular invader, making it challenging to get antibiotic weapons delivered into the infected cells to kill it. 20% of untreated typhoid cases tend to die, so it's nothing but bad news. By the way, it causes skin rashes, vomiting, stuff going up the other end, and if it goes bad, you've got that internal hemorrhage and death. Also, it can cause severe dehydration, and did I mention death? Because uh, yeah, you're also gonna be delirious before you die. During the siege in 1098, the crusaders who were besieging the walled city kinda died in large numbers from typhoid because it broke out in their camp. Not fun. Scarlet fever is a bacterial infection of the strep variety. It is mildly communicable and produces high fevers, painful rashes, swollen glands in the face, sore throat, and a weird texture of the tongue. It could cause lifelong conditions of the heart, liver, kidneys, and lungs, and back in the day, it was a very serious illness. Here's a more modern one. So a post-mortem section of appendicitis was initially described by the leading German surgeon of the 18th century, Lorenz Heister, in 1711. Nevertheless, so a lot of folks comment that while the pathological appearances clearly described in the autopsy had already been noted by him, yeah, this was kind of wild at the time. The first operation for acute appendicitis was performed by J. Mustivier in 1759. He described the case of a 45-year-old patient admitted to St. Andrew Hospital in Bordeaux for a mass localized on the right side of the umbilical area. The mass was fluctuant and was opened, and they got a lot of pus, which, gross. The patient died shortly after, and during the autopsy it was found that the abscess had started from a small pin covered with salts perforating the appendix. The description of symptoms, possibly attributed to the pain of appendicitis, is found in the work of the German physician J.P. Frank, who writes of this picture as perionitis muscularis in 1792. And to this day, a lot of folks get their appendix out for safety and for this reason. Nowadays, the common cold is just that, and easily medicated after a run to the pharmacy, but that wasn't always the case way back in the day. In the early Middle Ages, the main objective of somebody treating a cold was to remove the mucus from the head. This is according to the Natural Remedies textbooks of the time. How would you do this? Well, an infusion of cabbage leaves was a good idea. A mixture of the juice of the black beetroot and honey administered through the nose would also do the trick. In summer, you could uh, mess around with clover by mashing it and boiling it in water, and then you'd chug that and have fun. And then also, if you were gonna gargle something, maybe do a mixture of mustard, turnip seed, pepper, rocket, oregano, and celery seed mixed with honey and hot water, or one made of mustard seed, sweetened vinegar, uh, you've got some poisons, high sop heads, and once again, honey. On top of this, don't go near wine, don't take baths, and uh, don't go out in the cold. There were regular waves of pestilence or plague back in the day, but in 1348 and 1349, an illness came to Britain that killed more people than ever, even the young, strong, and healthy, and it came into Europe from the east, carried by fleas that lived on black rats. You guessed it, it's the Black Plague, or the Black Death. Its signs were fever, a terrible thirst, and dark blotches under the skin, and that's how the disease got its name, the Black Death. Almost half the population of Britain died of it. That is nearly 1.5 million people. Whole villages were wiped out by the disease. Or if you were still hanging around, you'd get the heck out of there. In a lot of villages, there was nobody left to take care of the fields, and then you've got famine, and that's gonna kill or drive everybody out that's left. You can still see the sites of some of these deserted villages today, by the way. At the time, nobody knew what caused the disease, and medieval medicine was kinda powerless against it. A lot of folks felt hopeless and afraid. They were like, okay, this is a sign that God is angry with us. We get it. And finally for today, ergotism. So this would follow a famine or a hard year. Grains that were damaged or stored in a damp environment could develop certain fungi. And when you eat in this, when you consume this, these little buggers cause psychosis, hallucination, vertigo, upchucking, and gangrene of the extremities. In today's modern age, if bread starts looking funky, we just tend to eat around it or toss it. But back in the day, people didn't have that awareness. 
or luxury. So what happens when you eat this? Well, you're gonna look like you're bewitched, but it turns out you're just flying higher than a kite. Ergot thrives in a cold winter followed by a wet spring, and victims will suffer twitches, spasms, cardiovascular trouble, and a lot more. It also seriously weakens the immune system. Human poisoning due to the consumption of rye bread made from ergot-infected grain was kind of common. The first mention of a plague of a lot of gangrene from ergot in Europe comes from Germany in 857. And following this, France, Scandinavia had similar outbreaks. England is notably absent from the historical regions affected by this because their main source of food was wheat, which is resistant to the fungi. In 944, a massive outbreak of ergotism caused 40,000 deaths in the regions of Limousin, Perigord, and a lot of other places in France. It's actually believed to have played a large role in witch hunts because the symptoms of poisoning and sides of bewitchment are almost identical. Well, that's it for me once again, folks. I've been Alexa, your resident emo girly. See y'all next time I buzz in over here at Bumblebee.